presenter option. And you're all set. Very well, very well, Jameson. Thank you very much. Looks good on the side. So is it working? Can you see my, my screen? It looks good. Okay. So should I start or uh, are you going to make an introduction or do you want me to, to introduce my Oh, I'll read my script. Hello and welcome to Palisade Corporation's webcast, Insurance and Reinsurance Applications of At-Risk. Examples from Agrosomex and the World Bank. Presented by Luis Arturo Castellanos. My name is Jameson Romeo Hall, and I will be your host today, and I'll be available to help answer technical questions by chat. At this time, all attendees are in a listen-only mode. Please note that as an attendee, you are part of a larger audience today. The attendee list will be suppressed to maintain attendee privacy. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. You may ask an online question anytime throughout the presentation today, by typing in the chat panel. I would also encourage you to visit our website and sign up for a free trial download of our software, including our lead products, At Risk, and the Decision Tool Suite. We invite you to sit back and relax and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce your presenter, Luis Arturo. You're ready to go. Thank you very much, Jameson. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this presentation of insurance and reinsurance applications of at risk. Um, I'm going to go through several different topics. These are the ones that I'm going to be covering today. Um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to insurance, just a brief one. Of course, this is not intended to be a, a, a thorough or a, a, a deep, a deep uh, discussion about the theory about insurance, just a brief introduction to it. Because then what I want to show you is some model that I did for uh, applications and insurance. So I'm going to be talking about a premium calculation model, uh, then a reserves calculation model. Then I'm going to show you a reinsurance application of, um, of, uh, of at risk to finally tell a little bit about solvency, sorry, solvency 2. Okay? So let's go into brief, a brief introduction to insurance. So what is insurance? Well, insurance, of course, is a financial risk transfer instrument designed with the purpose to eliminate the negative, the negative economical consequences of a loss suffered by an individual, which is rather assumed by a community or a group of persons that will afford the, job, the loss jointly, of course, with a lower economical damage than if the individual is the loss by himself. So um, that's that's the the purpose of an insurance of an insurance product. Mathematically speaking, insurance transforms the individual risk into probabilities that are easier to easier to afford by an by an organization. Okay. So um, let me see if I can. Insurance isn't is as old as the social organization. Okay. Uh, in the beginning, insurance started as solidarity of a community to face losses by individuals. For instance, in the Middle Ages, primitive insurance schemes were developed in order to cover against harvest losses or storage of grains. So you can see that um, insurance has, it has been it's very, very old. Uh, but the, the first proper insurance co contract came from a ship insurance in the Mediterranean Sea due to navigation commerce. So in the 17th and the, in the 18th centuries, the first insurance companies were born, in, of course, in London, England, um, where is the travel of insurance. The Lloyd's, the Lloyd's Syndicate. Okay, so what is an insurance contract? The insurance contract is any contract in which an insurer is forced to identify 
the loss suffered by an insured in case a risky event occurs by means of the payment of a premium. So the the insurer has to has to pay an, an indemnification to the people who who bought the insurance contract, but the insurer the insured has to pay a premium in order to get this coverage. Okay, so the insurance taker, which might not necessarily be the same as the person insured, is forced to pay this premium in ex in exchange of the coverage given by the insurer, which voids him to face a greater loss, of course. That's why you, you pay this premium, because by paying this premium you are covered against um, a, a greater loss, which uh, is the the the, the unsure event that can happen here, the risk event. So of course there are many, many elements in an insurance in an insurance product. And notice that of course there's risk here. And that's why I highlight here because since since there's uncertainty about an event uh, that facing risk and that's where at risk will become helpful. Um, the insured object is whatever you want to insure. So, for instance, you can insure your life, okay? And many people can say, "What? Why are you interested in covering your life if, when you are dead, um, then of course you don't have any interest about interest about it?" But here, the, the the issue here is that you want to cover, for instance, your loved ones, your relatives, your 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 uh, descendants, or your your spouse. So you want to have coverage for them when you are missing. Okay, so that's why you might have an interest in covering your life. But of course, you can also cover your car, or uh, your building, your house, whatever, or even crops, for instance. I'm going to show you some examples of uh, agriculture insurance. Then, the interest insured is the interest the insured has in getting something covered. So that's why I, I told you about you have your interest perhaps not directly in your life when you are there, but the interest is in uh, having some coverage for the people that come after you. Okay, then the sum insured is the maximum obligation of the insurer. So that's um, the maximum amount that will be paid in case uh, a loss a loss happens, in case a claim uh, a claim is uh, is paid. Then the premium is the amount that should be paid by the insured to get coverage. Uh, the accident, of course, is, is the adverse event, the one you don't, the one you don't want to happen, but that's that's the one you are getting covered against. And the loss is the actual payment that you return. Okay, so these are just some terminology, some um, some elements about insurance, and I guess you can you, you can see that risk, of course, is is very important here. So now let me show you some premium calculation models. Um, so what is a premium? I already told you that the premium is the amount the insured must pay in order to get insurance coverage in exchange. So it is the expected value of the total claim. Okay, so, so there is not one single method to estimate the premium, but normally the premium is comprised of the following elements. You can see here a little formula, which is very, very simple, a very simple formula. So first of all, the premium depends on mu, which is a measure of the expected loss. So you you have to calculate the expected loss. And then there's some sigma, which is a measure of the variability of the loss. You also have to take into account the variability of the loss. And finally, an insurance company will have all of these, these concepts, which are for instance, the OE is the operating expenses, then RC is the reinsurance cost, and finally you also have to add some some sort of a profit. But because of course this is this is a business, so um, uh, you need to add also a profit desired. Uh, it is often common to represent the, the expenses and the profit as a proportion of something which we like to call the pure risk premium. So you can sometimes see the formula change as this one. So you will see now that it's only mu plus the sigma. So you get this pure risk premium on, on the top of the formula. 
and on the denominator you will see the total expenses. So it's one minus the total expenses, which will be the addition of, of your operating expenses, your reinsurance costs, and also the profit, which will go into the total expense. So this is another way of uh, calculating the premium as well. But as you can see, of course, perhaps you can start noticing that you will need to calculate not only the, the expected losses, but also you need to get a sense of the viability in these losses. So that's where at risk will come handy. So let me show you graphically how the portfolio loss distribution looks like. This will be like a histogram of the total losses. So of course you don't know what the loss will be in a portfolio. Sorry. Uh, so this is a histogram of the total distribution of the losses. So you can see here that there's uncertainty about how much you will have to pay as an insurance company. Okay? Of course, the, the, you have an expected value, which is the mean, and in this case, for instance, the mean is 3.4, but notice that the probability that this 3.4 loss happens is exactly zero. This loss can go as far off, up as $6 million or $7 million, for instance, and some there will be some occasions in which the loss will be lower than $3.4 million. The minimum in this example is $1 million. So you can see here that there's uncertainty around the loss that you will face as an insurance company. There's your mean. And there's also um, a, term, a, a, a concept in insurance which is called the probable maximum loss which is none other than a certain percentile in your distribution. For instance, a 95% percentile, which in this case is, uh, for instance, $5 million, $5.3 million. So th that, that's another very useful information that you can provide by doing your address model. Okay, so I have two different models, which I'm going to show you. Um, uh, here with at risk, I'm going to show you the actual models that I that I built. So these are two different premium calculation model examples. Okay, so I'm going to switch now to to at risk. So here's at risk, and first let me show you this coffee premium model and have over here. So this is my model. So let me go a little bit through it. The first thing that you need to have is uh, a, a whole portfolio. When you have uh, an insurance model, it's very important to have your model, your portfolio perfectly defined because um, in insurance, it's very important to have the, 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 big, the big numbers. So you need to have a, a big portfolio. The bigger the portfolio, the better the, the dispersion of your model. So uh, you will have a, a, a lower, for instance, a lower probable maximum loss. Okay? So here's my model already loaded into at risk. And you can start seeing here many, many things. For instance, I have here my risk units, which are in this case, I have 42 different risk units. So in this case, think of it as, for instance, different individuals in a life, in a life insurance portfolio, or different buildings in a property, in a property insurance portfolio, or different cars. So this is one automobile and another automobile, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are my buildings, for instance, or my houses, or my different individuals in a life insurance policy. But in this case, this is, of course, an agriculture insurance because I used to work for this company called Agrasemex, which is an insurance company, state insurance company in Mexico, um, which deals with livestock and agricultural insurance. So this is an insurance, um, of course, not, this is not a model built for directly for Agrasemex, but it's an example very similar to it in the sense that I have coffee insurance, so each one of these are different weather stations and um, 
in, in, in Guatemala. So this is many, many different weather stations, each one of those. For instance, 379 is one weather station in Guatemala, and so on and so forth. Then you have the surface. So this is the number of hectares that each weather station covers. So each, each weather station can uh, cover a different amount of surface, depending on how much coffee they sow in each, in each uh, nearby each weather station. And then I want to show you here this index. So this index is actually my uncertain, my uncertain variable. You can, for those of you already um, that already know about at risk, you can see this blue cell, which means that this is an input. Okay, so let me show you this distribution. You will see that this is my distribution for the index, and this is the amount of rain that the weather station can receive in any particular year. So you will see here that it can, it, you, you can receive a, an uncertain amount of rain here, which ranges from 100 to about 400 millimeters. So um, this is uh, my distribution for rainfall in this particular example. But each weather station has a different a different distribution. Of course, the distribution might be the same ones, but the parameters might be different. For instance, let me show you here another weather station in which now, for instance, perhaps the probability is a little bit lower of getting a high, a high event, a high amount of rainfall. Okay, so on so forth. So notice that even though I have the same distribution, which is actually called a kernel distribution, which is not one that you will find inside at risk, but what I'm using is the general distribution. You can see here that I am using the general distribution and the parameters are the densities of the distribution. So notice that I can build many different things, like for instance, this chart which has many different modes. So the kernel distribution is like a tailor-made distribution. Okay? So this is an example of a different, um, the, the distribution for a different weather station. Okay? So, um, so on and so forth, for each weather station, I have a different distribution. So now I want to show you that this is the amount, remember I told you about the sum insured. So this is the amount that you will have to pay in case you face a loss in a weather station, which is in this case $835, for instance. So finally, this is the total sum insured, which is the sum insured per hectare multiplied by the number of hectares that you have. Since in this, in this simple example, I only have one hectare per risk unit, of course, my total sum insured is always $835. Okay. Now the interesting the interesting thing is the trigger. This trigger means when should I start paying? So notice for instance that this is two hundred and ninety nine. Okay, so that means that if the total rainfall is exceeds two hundred and ninety nine because this weather insurance product was developed for excess rainfall. This is a, a, a region in Guatemala that has um a lot of rainfall throughout the year. So if rain is higher than 299 millimeters, then you will pay. And for each additional millimeter, you will pay $14, which is this peak. $14 is the amount you will have to pay for each additional dollar that rainfall exceeds from 299 millimeters. So let me show you again this distribution. So the number you see here, 228, is just the mean of the of the distribution, but the trigger is 299, so I can move this delimiter over here to 299. So you will see that there's a 6% chance of exceeding 299 millimeters. Roughly, there's a 6% chance that you will face a claim in this particular weather station. Okay? But 
you will see again that each whiskey unit has a different distribution. So for instance, let me show you this one. Notice that rain is lower in this station, in station 442. You will see that the distribution, the mean of the distribution is a little bit lower. So in this case also the trigger is lower. So you will start paying until rain reaches 214 millimeters. So let me just show you this same example here. This is the, the, the weird chart I, cho I showed you. And now the trigger is 214. So let me just move this to 214. And you will see that there's roughly a 5% chance of exceeding, exceeding this trigger. Okay? So each weather station has its own parameters, its own distribution, but in the end, what you want here is to calculate the total losses that you will face. So that's my output here. Notice that it's on, on, on red. So here I'm calculating whether the actual, the actual um, simulation, the actual iteration is higher or not than the trigger that I am using in each weather station. If it's higher, then you will have to pay the tick times the difference between the index and the tree. Okay? So in this case, the uncertain variable is how much will it rain, let's say, this year, 2014. And of course, nobody can know that. Not even meteorologists can tell you how much rain it will, it will fall in, in each one of the stations. So what you are doing is, of course, I am using historical data in order to fit a distribution here. And once I have fit my distribution, I can at least get a, a, a sense of how much rain it will, it will fall in each one of the weather stations. Okay? So this is my output. My outputs are these ones. For each weather station, I have an output. But most importantly, notice that I have here my total, my total loss, which will be the total portfolio loss. So notice that I am here adding everything up. I'm adding all the, all the losses that I will have throughout all the different risk units, okay? So that's my portfolio loss. And then remember I told you how to calculate the premium. Well, you will need to calculate the mean. So let me show you that I have here the mean of the portfolio, which is K44. I'm going to go over here to K44. So this is the, the, total, uh, the total portfolio loss. So this is the mean and finally this is my PML as well. So let me now show you a simulation of this. I'm going to run 5,000 different iterations of this. Okay, so let's run this, this model once so I can show you how the distribution looks like. It's, it's running now. It will take less than a minute to finish. There we go. So it has already uh, run one simulation of this. Actually, I have some statistics over here as well. These green cells are simulation results from uh, my, my output. So you can see, for instance, that this weather station has a higher probability, a 10% probability of exceeding the trigger. And for instance, this one seems to be a very, very humid weather station where you will receive, it will fall a lot of rain here in this weather station. So there's a higher probability here of facing a loss in this weather station. But in the end, what you what, as an insurance company, what you would like to know is what's the total loss that I'm facing, okay? So of course you don't know that, but you can make a little chart of this. So this is the total distribution of the losses that you will face. Of course I'm I'm dividing this by the total sum insured. Notice that I am dividing here this by the total sum insured, which in this case is thirty-five thousand dollars. Okay, so since I'm dividing it by the total sum insured, I get I get a rate here. So this is a rate, a proportion. Okay, you can you can see it here, rate for portfolio. So the mean 
I can make here a little chart and let me add a marker for the mean and also for the PML. But instead of the 95, I want the 99% PML. Okay? So you can see some markers here. So the mean is 6%, but the, nine, the PML is 46%. Okay? You can see the markers here, which graphically are very, very good to see where the mean is and where the PML is. Okay? So let me now go back to my model and show you the calculations for the premium. So you can see here that the mean is 6%. You can use this formula which says risk mean and it will calculate the mean for you. And also the percentile formula which will give the PML. And you can change the PML here to any, any uh, probability that you're, you're confident in. In this case I'm using, as you can see, a 99%. So that's 46% of PML. So then I add this margin, remember I told you about? So it's not only the mean, but also I add a, a proportion of this PML. So I will need to add 2% more to this 6% mean in order to get my pure risk premium. This mean plus margin is my pure risk premium, which is 8%. And finally, if I add all the expenses, in this case are for instance, 15%, then I will get my total premium, which is 10%. So remember I told you I have a total to be insured of $35,000. In this case, here's my $35,000 that I have a total to be insured. So my premium should be $3,000, about $3,500, which is 10% of the total to be insured. Okay, so this is a, a model, a very simple model to calculate the premium of uh, an insurance product. Okay. So let me go back to my presentation. Okay. And uh, you can see in my presentation some more details about the project. This is where I I was using my where I was um, where I designed the insurance product inside Guatemala. So you can see that I have one weather station for each one of these grid points in Guatemala. There you go. For each road, uh, point in the grid, there's great daily precipitation data for 30 years. So based on this daily precipitation data, I was able to build the distribution functions, the distributions for each one of these weather stations. Okay. Um, so there's, for instance, one of the distributions that I fitted for one of the grid points, okay? So this is the kernel distribution that I fitted for each of my weather stations. But a different weather stations might have a different distribution, as you can see over here. Okay? Um, so I've already showed you this model. I want to go to a different model, and I'm going to skip this one, because I want to show you now the reserves calculation model. Okay? Reserves are the resources necessary to pay the obligations of the insurance company. Normally there are three different types of reserves, which are the risk risk in processes reserves, then you have the incurred but not reported reserves. It's also called the IDNR reserve. And you might also have technical special reserves, like a catastrophic reserve. Okay, so I'm going to deal with um, the IDNR reserve, which uh, reflects the total amount owed by the insurer to all valid claimants who have had a covered loss but have not yet reported it. So sometimes it happens, for instance, in life insurance, that uh, perhaps um, someone is insured, someone bought an, uh, a life insurance policy, but perhaps um, his wife isn't aware of this. So perhaps he died and uh, the, the wife wasn't aware of this insurance policy, but after cleaning everything up, let's say um, six months later or perhaps a year after the death, she found out this policy. So she goes to the insurance company and claims, and claims that uh, his uh, her wife, uh, her husband is dead. 
So um, sometimes these these claims come after some time, after uh, sometime after the after the, the the death happened, for instance. So sometimes the insurer knows need of many of these losses, the frequencies have occurred, know the severity of each loss. So the IVNR is necessarily an estimate. You need to estimate how much you will have to pay in the future for claims that, uh, or for events that have happened perhaps already. Okay, so when a policy of insurance is written, it will typically cover a defined, a defined period from inception of the policy. It's usually a 12-month period uh, from inception of the policy. The number of and costs of claims that arise from the policy are, are known and are only knowable amounts at the inception. Okay, so indeed at expiry, uh, sorry, at expiry of the policy, there can be a high degree of uncertainty as to what the cost of claims will ultimately be. So the insurer will conduct a reserving exercise with a view to assessing what this ultimate cost will be. Okay, so there are, there are different methods for, for calculating these reserves. Uh, but the most common ones are the chain ladder, another called Bonter Ferguson, and they're also called exposure-based methods. So I'm going to show you the chain ladder method, which is a very common method. So the chain ladder method consists of estimating the future losses by forecasting or trying to project the current, the current claims based upon the historical growing factors by year. So um, please apologize that I have this table in Spanish, but you will see that, for instance, you have this, the occurred year, so 2001, 2002, 2005, and this is the sum of claims that you will have in the same year, one year later, two years later, three years later, and four years later. Okay, so you know, this is what you know already that you have paid, and you will have to estimate all these red numbers over here, which is the future payment that you will have to make. Okay? So this is something that you will have to estimate, all these red figures over here, in order to get this reserve here, which in this case, for instance, is $2 million. Okay? So their reserve is estimated at the difference between the total claims, the total estimated claims, minus the current claims that you have paid today. Okay, so this is a very, very simple formula for the I, IMBR reserve, which is the total estimated claims minus the current claims. That's the reserve. Okay, so usually the model we will use to estimate. Uh, I'm going to to show you now a model to estimate the IV, IVNR reserve using this chain ladder method. Um, the chain ladder method needs some data. You will need historical data of claims by policy or origin. So this is the origin of the policy. This is a, poli a policy that was uh, underwritten in 2003. This is a policy that was underwritten in 2010, and so on and so forth. So you have this development table over here. So that data is usually provided in the format of this triangle because by now, by year 10, you already know all the payments of the origin policies of 2001. But for instance, you still have some payments that can make from all the policies that were originated in 2002 and so on and so forth. Of course, by, uh, by now you don't know any of the payments that will have to be made for the policies that were originated in 2010, etc. So this is how your data looks like when you try to build a chain ladder model. Okay? So then you will have to first accumulate the total losses so far by adding the values up to the value. So you will have to add, for instance, in this case, you will have to add 5,000 plus 3,000, you will get this 8,000 over here, and so on and so forth. So this is like the cumulative payment, payment that you have already done. Okay?
So this way, what we uh, what we calculate is the latest paid so far. You can see that this is the latest that you have paid so far from each or even year. Okay. So the objective of the method is to the lower half of this triangle. This is unknown for you. You don't know how much you will have to pay in the future from all of this. Okay. So how do you do that? The chain ladder, the chain ladder method will use from the cumulative table I showed you before, this cumulative table, it will calculate some development factors, which I call here FD. So you will have to estimate for each year this development factor, which is none other than the cumulative for year two divided by the cumulative claim at year one. Okay? For instance, the development factor of 6, 7 means the cumulative claim at year 7 divided by the cumulative claim at, six, at, at year 6. And so on and so forth. So you will need to calculate these development factors. So for instance, this 2.6 means that at year two, two, two thousand, uh, 2003, um, it grew uh, two times more from year 2 than what you have at year one. But for instance, in year 2005, it grew four times more than what you have. It grew at a, at, a four, a, at a four times rate at the second year, and so on and so forth. Of course, you will see that these rates or these factors start to uh, become one once you go very far away in the future, OK? So the chain ladder method calculates the mean for each year. So this is the mean for all the development factors at year two. This is the mean at year three. This is at year four, and so on and so forth. So you can see that you will need to estimate the mean of the development factor. Okay? The mean for each development year is calculated in the bottom row. Once you have these means of the development factors, you can estimate the lower triangle very easily by just projecting the cumulative claims by using the corresponding mean development factor for each year accordingly. So for instance, once you know this $16,000, all you have to use is the, the mean development factor for year 10 and apply it to this $16,000 and you will get up with this $16,800. On uh, 858 that you will see here, and so on and so forth. For each number here in the lower triangle, you can calculate, or the chain ladder method tells you that you should calculate it by using this development factor. So in the end, you will get this reserve over here by just calculating the total estimated losses, which in this case is $215,000 minus what you have already paid which is $160,000, so the reserve should be $56,000, okay? You can see it here. But I guess you can already see here a problem with this method. A big flaw here is that you are doing a point estimate here, okay? You are using some development factors that are deterministic, okay? So now I'm going to show you a forecasting tool that I built for chain ladder. Okay, so I'm going to change now to at risk. Again, I'm going to close my copy premium model. And now I'm going to show you this IBNR model that I built. Okay, so here you have your original data. So this is my original data over here, the one I'm hi highlighting right here. This is my original data that I should have had in order to make be able to, to make a, an IBNR model. And then remember I told you first that you need to test these, which are the cumulative ones. So this is my, my these are my cumulative cumulative claims. So remember this is the total that I have paid so far, $160,000.
Okay? So these are then my development factors. You can see the formula here. It's T2 divided by B2. So this is how much it grew from one year to the other one. And so more, so on and so forth. This is the factor at which it, it grew from one year to one. So on and so forth. So in the end, I have here my the means. These are the means for each development factor. So this is what chain ladder will do. Okay, once you have this, all you have to do is estimate the lower triangle very easily. But now what I will do is I will go to my model and instead of using these means for each development factor, now I'm going to use distribution. Okay? So this is my original table, the cumulative table. But now, let me show you that instead of using a deterministic, a deterministic number for the development factors, I'm going to use distributions, okay? So this is the distribution for the second factor. In this case, you will see here 2.9, but let me show you that it's actually a distribution. And I'm using here Pareto distribution, okay? So this is a Pareto distribution telling you that there's a minimum of 1.72, and it can go up as far as, well, the Pareto goes as far as uh, infinity, but in reality, there's a better probability of exceeding, for instance, an eight, eight development factor. Okay, the mean is 2.8, which is the number you will see here, which if I go back to my chain ladder, you will see that the mean is 2.7, which is pretty similar to the one I'm using over here as the parameter for my, for my Pareto distribution in this case. For instance, for year three, Again, I will use a Pareto, but with different parameters. So now, for instance, the, the mean is 0.7, which resembles, of course, the mean that I have over here, 1.689. And so on and so forth for each year. I have, of course, different parameters, but all of them are using Pareto distribution. Okay? So these are my random variables now. I will use on certain, on certain uh, development factors for each one of my different development years, okay? So once this is given by a simulation, then I will calculate the total triangle for here. Notice that I'm using here, the formula tells you it's the amount that you have in the year before times the development factor here, and so on and so forth using the development factors for accordingly for each year. Okay? So now you can see that in each iteration it's going to use a different development factor based on what has happened in history, of course. Notice that I'm, all I'm using is the history that I have behind. But now instead of using this deterministic number over here, each iteration is going to use a different, a different and random Okay, so now let me run one simulation. Before I do that, just let me show you here my calculation of the reserve. In this case, I'm showing you a reserve of $58,000 approximately. But now, when I, when I will run a simulation, this will become a distribution, which is, of course, better. Okay, so let me run one simulation of this model. And now you can see here that you will get a whole distribution of the reserve. So now instead of just giving a point estimate of the reserve, this $57,000 or whatever, by using the chain ladder method, of course the mean is the same, $57,000, about $58,000, but now I get a whole distribution of what the reserve looks like. So perhaps I can now make better decisions by using this very valuable inf information. For instance, look, look like there's a, a non-neglectable probability of uh, that the reserve will go as far as $109,000. So this 
57,000 about half of what you can actually get with a 95 with a 5% probability so um, I guess you can now see that it's very important to build stochastic models for also for research instead of just using your typical chain ladder models now you can do a much better model which is now stochastic okay so uh, with that we I have now shown you an example of reserves models of the IDNR model, IDNR reserve. So now I'm going to go back to my presentation in order to show you now some reinsurance models. Okay, so now let's talk about reinsurance. So what is reinsurance? Well, reinsurance is the insurance that is purchased by an insurance company, which is also called a seeding company, from uh, one or more other insurance companies. So you might have several reinsurance companies. They are called the reinsurer as a means of risk management. So this is now how insurance companies uh, transfer or manage their own risk that they are facing. So the seeding company and the reinsurer enter into a reinsurance agreement which details the conditions upon which the reinsurer would pay a share of the claims insured by the seeding company. So the reinsurer, of course, is, is paid a reinsurance premium by the seeding company, which issues an insurance policies to its own policyholders. Okay? So almost all insurance companies or I would say all insurance companies have an insurance program. The ultimate goal here is to reduce the exposure that the insurance company is facing by passing part of the of the risk to a reinsurer or a group of reinsurers. <coughs> so here are some of the schematics of our insurance um, reinsurance program. Of course, what you would like here is a retention limit, an insurance limit and then a reinsurance limit <coughs> because what you would you would like as an insurance company is to get your PML covered by reinsurance program okay <coughs> so this is the schematics of our insurance and of course there are many different types of reinsurance programs but the most common ones or the most common types of reinsurance are these ones the first, which is called a proportional reinsurance, or also called quota share, in which one or more reinsurers take a stated percentage or stated share of the risk written by the insurer. The reinsurer receives this percentage of, uh, of the premiums, but also will pay the same percentage of the claim. So you can see that this is, uh, in, this is proportional. If you share, for instance, 40% of the premium, then their insurer is also responsible of 40% of the premium. But there's a different one which is called a non-proportional reinsurance uh, scheme in which the reinsurer only will pay out if the total claim suffered by the insurer in a given period exceeds a stated amount. This stated amount is also called retention or priority. Okay, so let me show you some examples, some very, very easy examples. Let's suppose the total premiums of this line are $2,000. So you will use a proportional reinsurance scheme of a 30% quarter share. So let's say a 30% quarter share is, is, is contracted and the total claims are $1,500. Okay, so let's see how this will look like. The premiums will be 600 for their insurer because you will only share 30% with their insurer. So the second, the insurance company will retain $1,400. Uh, so this, this is just, you will split $2,000 into 30% and 60%. So how will the claims look like? Well, of course, the insur their insurer will be uh, we'll have to pay 
$450, while the insurance company will have to pay $1,050, which is 60% of the total claim of $1,500. Okay, so this is a proportional scheme to take forward. But now let's suppose an Excel uh, and stop losses scheme with a layer of $1,500 in excess of $1,000. And let me show you two different claim scenarios, one in which the loss is $700 and another one in which the loss is $1,200. Okay, so let me show you the scheme. The scheme in this, in this sense is totally different now, it's not proportional. So the scheme tells you that the priori priority is here, $1,000, that's the priority. And um, now you have Fifteen hundred dollars, which will be the total, the total limit of the the total layer capacities of this reinsurance scheme. So, in the first scenario, in which the loss is seven hundred dollars, of course the reinsurance company will not have to pay anything because it didn't exceed the limit, the priority of one thousand dollars. So, all the claims will be. Respons a responsibility of the insurance company. Okay, so you will see here a zero, so the, ins the insurance company will not have to make any payment in this scenario. But in the second scenario, of course, the first thousand dollars will be a responsibility of the insurance company, and the next two hundred dollars will be a responsibility of the reinsurance company. So you can see here now the difference between a stop loss program. And, and, and a proportional problem. Of course, they are very, very different, and they are useful for different, different things. Okay, so the objective of a stop loss reinsurance is to cover against deviations from the mean. Perhaps the insurance company expects a thousand dollars, so that's why you will need a limit of one thousand dollars, and from from then on, their insurance company will be responsible of any losses on top of that. So you can see it differently here. Insurance, the objective of a stop loss insurance is to cover against deviations from the mean. So all the losses on the right hand tail of the distribution will be respons a responsibility of the reinsurance company. So this is your poor risk premium. Then you might have, for instance, a catastrophic reserve, so that will be helpful for you in order to, 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 to to increase the priority. So this will be the priority or the starting point of the stop loss. So the stop loss will cover you from this point up to a limit of the stop loss. A stop scheme. So the advantage of a stop loss insurance is that the loss distribution stops at a certain point, as you can see in this little chart. This is where you will stop losing money if you have insurance company. Okay, so I guess you can feel now that simulation becomes essential in estimating stop loss program. I, I don't see how you can calculate the premium of a stop loss program if you don't have a simulation model. Okay, so to exemplify the use of reinsurance, I will use, I will show you this particular example. So I'm going to go back to my to my Excel to my at risk and I'm going to open this one which is called I guess reinsurance one. Yeah this one over here. Of course at risk wants me if I want to use the simulation settings that my model already has. And please apologize I'm just noticing that I have this model in, in Spanish, but you will be able to see what this model does. Okay, so I have here, this is a model I built for a hotel company, a, a hotel firm which has many, many different hotels, many different properties, and what I want to see here is how many, how many earthquakes can happen, and also how many hurricanes. So this hydro, stands for hurricane, and this 
this move here is for earthquake. Okay, so this is hurricane and this is earthquake. So in this model, of course, this model is a little bit more complex in the sense that now I have a Poisson distribution. Let, let me show how it looks like. I have a Poisson distribution for the number of hurricanes that can be expected in a particular year. The Poisson distribution only has one parameter, which in this case is 1.42. So notice that even though the parameter is 1.42, you can still end up with some scenarios in which there are no no hurricanes. Some scenarios in which, of course, the most common one is one, but then you can have two, three, four, even as even up as at six. Six hurricanes can happen in one particular year. This will be a measurement of how many events, how many hurricane events can happen in one particular year. I also have one for the for the for the earthquakes. So this is a measure of how many earthquakes you can expect in one particular year. So you can see that this is even higher. You can expect about two hurricanes in uh, I mean two earthquakes in one year. But there will be some scenarios with zero earthquakes. And there can be also some scenarios with five or six earthquakes in one year. So this is a one year that we are going to monitor here. And then I have here something which I call the, the event number. Let me call it the event number. Okay, so this is the first event, the second event, the third event, and so on, so forth. So this is my first earthquake. Okay, so this is the loss of the earthquakes and this is the loss of my hurricanes. Okay, so in my first hurricane, I will lose, I will lose a hundred, uh, I mean, 1.6 million dollars. This is, of course, in million dollars. In the second hurricane, I can lose to 7.8 million dollars, and so on and so forth. Each one of my different events will have a, a different uh, claim. So notice now that here I have a total, a to, uh, I mean, if I have only one hurricane event, then it will only take into account the first loss here, because I only have one event. Okay? But let me show you a different scenario. For instance, in this case, I have four different earthquakes, so it will take into account the first four earthquake events. So in the end, I will have a, a total of five million dollars here, because there were four different earthquakes here. Okay, so this is a total loss of earthquakes, and this is a total loss thanks to hurricanes. Okay, <coughs> sorry about that. So this is a total loss that I will face as an insurance company. So what you see here is what the insurance company will have to face, and then over here, what I have is what their insurance company will face. Okay, so here's my retention or my priority, and then here's my limit of the <coughs> of the of the of the insurance, the stop loss insurance uh, project. Okay, so notice that I can also have here, for instance, a retention and a limit a priority and a limit for earthquake and for hurricane. Okay? And I can own the same by event. Okay? So this is a total priority and the total limit for earthquake and the total priority and the total limit for hurricane. So I can play with these numbers now. For instance, let's say what happens if I add a priority of one million dollar and I reduce the limit to let's say two hundred million dollars for each one. Okay? If I will run now my model here. Let's run one simulation and see what happens. So 
So now what's going on is I'm simulating many, many different events of hurricane losses and earthquake losses. So this is a catastrophic, catastrophic uh, scheme. And now notice here the difference between, I'm going to show you here, a distribution here of the total losses that you will face as an insurance company as compared to what the insurance company faces. So there you have the insurance company will, will face, for instance, a mean of $18 million, but the insurance company only faces $15 million as a mean. But of course, perhaps it's, it's a little bit difficult to see the whole chart here because of the range, but I'm going to limit the range to perhaps 200. But you can see here the difference between the red and the green charts here, in which you see here now that the difference between them. If you don't use reinsurance, and once you use reinsurance, of course you will limit all your different your different uh, losses that you will face. So I guess this helps you understand that you cannot estimate reinsurance uh, premiums if you don't have a simulation model, or at least let's see the other way around. Simulation models are very useful to estimate the premium of our insurance contract, even more so if using a uh, stop loss, a non-proportional reinsurance reinsurance product. Okay, so I guess I guess this covers most of what I had in my in my presentation. Uh, I will go briefly, very quickly, through to the end of my presentation. So Solvency 2, finally Solvency 2 is a directive by the European Union that codifies and harmonizes the European Union insurance regulations. So primarily this concerns the amount of capital that the European Union insurance companies most hold to reduce the risk of insolvency. So once the directive is approved by the European Parliament, Solvency 2 will be scaled to come into effect, supposed to come into effect um, by the beginning of this year. But since the initial Solvency 1 directive was introduced in 1973, more elaborate risk management systems have developed. So Solvency 2 reflects new risk, risk management practices to define their required capital and to manage risk. So while the Solvency 1 directive was aimed at revising and updating the current uh, European Union Solvency regime, Solvency 2 has a much wider scope. So what Solvency 2 deals with, a Solvency capital requirement has the following purposes. To reduce the risk that an insurance would be unable to meet the claims. To reduce the losses suffered by policyholders in the event that a firm is unable to, to meet all the claims. And to provide also early warnings to the supervisors so that they can intervene promptly if capital falls below a required level and also to promote, to promote confidence in the financial stability of the insurance sector. So these are the purposes of Solvency 2. It's often called also the base for uh, insurance. Solvency 2 is somewhat similar to the banking regulations of Basel 2. For, for example, the proposed Solvency 2 framework has three main areas or three main pillars. Pillar one, which is consists of a quantitative requirement. For example, the amount of capital the insurer should hold. The, the second pillar sets out the requirements for the government, the governance, and the risk management of insurance, as well as for the effective uh, supervision of the insurers. And the third pillar focuses on the disclosure and the transparency requirements. So um, the Pillar 1 framework sets out the quali qualitative and quantitative requirements for calculation of technical provisions and the solvency capital requirement using either a standard formula given by the regulators or an internal model developed. And I highlight here because, of course, this requires that each insurance company develop its own internal model uh, for the for the solvency capital requirement calculations. 
So you will need a model here, and most importantly, a simulation model. So the technical provisions comprise of two components. The best estimate of the liabilities, which can be the, cent the central actuarial estimate, plus a risk margin. So the solvency capital requirement is the capital required to ensure that the reinsurance or the insurance company will be able to meet all their obligations over the next months with a probability of at least 99.5%. So notice now that we are talking about probabilities here. So this is where you will need, of course, your simulation model in order to estimate this percentile over here. In addition to the SCSCR, the minimum capital requirement is also needed to be calculated, which represents the threshold below which the national supervisor, the regulator, will intervene. So the minimum cap capital requirement is intended to correspond to the 85% probability of adequacy over a one-year period, and is bounded between 25 and 45% of the of the SCR. So you can see it graphically here. The capital requirement, this is this, the, the SCR, which is the 99.5 percentile, and the minimum capital requirement can be the 85 percentile. So I guess you can see here that simulation is very important in order to meet the solvency to, solvency to requirements. Most importantly, those who deal with the first with the first pillar. So thank you very much. This is all I have. I know that I'm at seven minutes past past what um, the moment that uh, the time that I have um, provided for this. But I hope you find you found this helpful for you. Well, I I sure did, uh, Luis Arturo. I I learned a lot. And there's a lot I didn't know about this. And, so I really appreciate it, and I think all of us really appreciate it. Do we do we have any questions? I don't see any yet that have come in. We can just wait a minute. Okay, let's wait. It's questions. fascinating information. I uh, I had no idea things were structured that way, and I didn't know much about it, and I'm glad I know more now. <laughs> Thank you, Jameson. Uh, well, I don't know. Let's see, are there any questions? Questions haven't come in yet. We can just wait another minute. Okay. And uh, I'll, I'll send out a follow-up email to everybody, and there'll be questions there. And if you're doing this recording in the future, please feel free to ask us questions. Um, let's see. Ah, I have one here. Oh, certainly. Uh, one of the questions is, can we obtain a copy of this presentation? We'll have a recording link that I'll send out, and I think they also may mean the uh, your slides. I think your slides are archived on the website from the user conference presentation. It's, are, are they a little different than? Or? Oh no, this is this is exactly the same one. I I presented okay, good. at, I can, at there. So if sure. you have it. You can, of course, I think share I have it. it with. Very okay. well. Perfect. I'll send that out. Mm -hmm. I'll send a, a note out to everybody, and they can reply if they want that. And let's see. Do we have any other questions? Well, oh, good. That might be the only question right now that we have. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm... Uh, I suppose I should let you go, and I'll, I'll let everybody go, and I'll send out a follow-up shortly. And if you don't hear from me later today, it'll be Monday. Okay. And I want to I want to thank everybody for coming, and certainly thank you, Luis Arturo. Thank you so much. Oh, it was my pleasure, James. And then I hope I hope people find this um, useful for them as well. Oh, I think I think it I think it was. <laughs> well, great, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jameson. <laughs> and thank you all for being here, and uh, have, have a nice day. Yes, thank you. <laughs>